Good morning. Welcome to Beyond Springs Second Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Following management's prepared remarks, we'll hold a brief question and answer session. As a reminder, this call is being recorded today, September 10, 2021. I will now turn the call over to Monique Kasi of LifeSci Advisors. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. I would like to advise listeners that comments made on today's call may reflect forward-looking statements that are related to such matters as Beyond Springs clinical and preclinical research and development activities and results, regulatory and commercial plans, industry trends, market potential, collaborative initiatives, and financial projections, among others. While management believes that its assumptions, expectations, and projections are reasonable in view of the currently available information, you are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. The company's actual results may differ materially from those discussed during this call for a variety of reasons, including those described in the forward-looking statements and risk factors sections of the company's 20F and other filings with the SEC, which are available on the Investors section of Beyond Springs' website. Joining us on today's call is Dr. Lan Huang, Beyond Spring co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer, Dr. Ramon Mohalno, executive vice president, research and development, and chief medical officer, Richard Daly, chief operating officer, and Elizabeth Serpak, chief financial officer. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Dr. Lan Huang. Lan? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's call. We're very pleased to be here today reporting our second quarter results and providing an update on the many meaningful events in the recent weeks. Everyone here at company is very excited as we have accomplished so much But most importantly, we're most excited for patients who are our North Star, who can be helped by our lead asset, Panabolin. Panabolin is a first-in-class, selective immunomodulating microtubule binding agent, or SIMBA. With clinical evidence from Dublin 3 and our CIN studies, we have revealed the dual benefit of Panabolin in the direct anti-cancer benefit of significantly extending overall survivor while also significantly reducing severe neutropenia induced by chemotherapy, which would be beneficial to patients in need. From the execution point, we have much more to look forward to in the next six to 12 months, including first, our the DUFA date is on November 30th this year for panablin and TCSF combination in CIM prevention and upcoming commercial launch in first quarter next year. Second, a planned NDA filing for panablin in non-sponsored lung cancer in the first half of 2022. And third, Continue development of our rich and deep pipeline, including panablin in triple IO combo in various cancers. Each of our upcoming milestones has the potential to provide significant shareholder value. Let me begin today by recapping the very meaningful events and data from the recent few months. I will then provide a few highlights of what to expect for us in the coming weeks and months before handing it over to Ramon and Rich to provide more detail on our scientific and clinical accomplishments and commercialization plans. Again, the past few weeks have truly been transformational for us at Beyond Spring. Most importantly, we were thrilled to announce positive data from our registrational trial of Dublin 3 in Panablin in second and third line non small lung cancer, which showed significant improvement in overall survivor 
especially in doubling the two-year and three-year survivor in the penavalin and docetaxel combination arm versus docetaxel alone. This underscores penavalin's immune durable anti-cancer benefit and makes us optimistic for its potential in other cancer combinations like triple IO combos. We have always believed penavalin to be a pipeline in a drug with the potential for approval in several indications. With the direct anti-cancer data in non-smoke lung cancer, we are well on our way to realizing our vision for penavalin. I'll let Ramon provide more color on the study and some high-level data. We are presenting additional data in 10 days at the late-breaking oral presentation at ASMO on September 20th. We are planning to host the call after the ASMO presentation. Another meaningful recent announcement was our strategic partnership between Fantren Bulin, our 58% owned China subsidiary, and Henry, a leading R&D and commercialization company with top expertise in oncology in China for the commercialization and co-development of penavalin in Greater China. This landmark partnership serves as a validation for, from a well-respected leading pharma for penavalin as a pipeline in the drug. Over the past 40 years, Henry has successfully grown to become the largest oncology drug sales company in China with the top-selling PD-1 inhibitor and docetaxel product and one of the top three GCSF products. Penavalin's potential for use in combination with these agents represents significant synergies and facilitates the development of penavalin in additional indications, thereby accelerating and increasing the achievement of peak cells in greater China. Important to note, not only have we partnered with the most respected company with the widest and deepest reach in the oncology space in China, we have done so at favorable terms for us. We retain manufacturing rights and have the right to receive 100% sales proceeds while paying a reasonable percentage of the net sales to Henry and having all the commercialization costs covered by Henry. Additionally, we will receive significant upfront and 50% cost sharing of development costs. Of note, we will retain 100% of our penavalent rights in all other global markets outside of China. Finally, the deal has attractive financial terms which gives us more cash runway. This includes an upfront payment of around 30 million and milestones of up to around 170 million, plus a 15 million investment in venture bullying at a pre-money valuation of around 560 million. As you are aware, our NDA for prevention of CRN had been accepted by China NMPA and the US FDA with priority review. Rich will provide more details on our plans for commercialization and launch in the US in early 2022, assuming approval by the FDA on our November 30th for DUFA date. Looking forward, I mentioned the most important date for DUFA date of November 30th, 2021 for penavalent in CIM prevention. Additionally, our regulatory team are in high gear preparing for our NDA filing for non small cell lung cancer indication, which we anticipate in the first half of 2022. Finally, with penavalent's unique immune mechanism as a SIMBA, and its durable anti-cancer clinical evidence shown in the Dublin 3 study, we have a well-planned path of development for penavalent in IO combos in various cancers 
to target unmet medical needs, which PD-1, pd one could not help. First, in PD-1, pd one failed patient. Second, the CRN issue in PD-1 and chemo combination. Third, immune-related SAE for IO combos. Fourth, the cold tumors. And fifth, first-line cancers, which need better efficacy in IO combos. We have undergone a few investigator-initiated studies to help to assess Panabolin's role in addressing these unmet medical needs. Ramon will talk more about this in his presentation. To summarize, I would like to thank our team for their commitment and tireless efforts. Everyone here believes in our mission and their passion has been driving us forward towards raising the standard care for cancer patients in the largest global markets of our first-in-class treatments. We are closer than ever now to achieving this mission and we all look forward to advancing Panablan and realizing upon our many opportunities to succeed. I will now turn the call over to Dr. Ramon Mohano for a brief review of our recent clinical developments. Ramon. Thank you, Lan. As Lan indicated, we are eagerly awaiting the PDUFA date for the CIN application later this year. We were naturally awaiting the results from Dublin 3 to obtain confirmation of the NABIN's anti-cancer activity, which we have now. It was exciting to see that the pronabin dose cell combination in Dublin 3 had met both the primary endpoint for overall survival and the key secondary endpoint for ORR and PFS. The significant reduction in grade 4 neutropenia by fivefold with the combination versus those cell alone supports planable CIN prevention benefit. The four year OS rate at 10.6% for the combination with planablin versus 0% with those cell alone underscores the durable anti-cancer benefit for penablin and is consistent with its immune mechanism of action. I also would like to mention that we conducted Dublin 3 at high quality standards on the US GCP. We used quality CROs for the conduct of Dublin 3. ICON was our global CRO for site selection, patient enrollment, and monitoring. All blood samples were sent to Covent's central laboratory for pharmacokinetic and hematology assessments, including neutrophil count. ICON pharmacovigilance uh, was used for uh, safety processing. As Lan mentioned, Planambulin's next focus in our clinical development program is to develop IO combinations in multiple cancer indications. Earlier this year, we presented phase one clinical data with Planambulin in combination with nivolumab and ipilimumab in small cell lung cancer, demonstrating a doubling of the anti-cancer results normally seen with nivolumab and ipilimumab alone. In that study, we also demonstrated that clonablin could reverse resistance to prior checkpoint inhibition therapy. Specifically, in this small cell lung cancer phase one data, which was presented at ASCO earlier this year, patients from US sites had an ORR of 46% in second and third line, and an ORR of 43% for PDL1 inhibitor failed patients, which also had a long duration of response, as long as 18 months. And at MD Anderson, we are conducting an investigator-initiated trial 
in seven different cancers, evaluating the safety and tolerability of phenablin in triple IO combination therapy with both PD-1, PD-L1 antibodies and radiotherapy in PD-1, PD-L1 failed patients. The first patient was enrolled in this phase 1b2 trial in June of this year. As was mentioned before, resistance to immunotherapy is a severe unmet medical need, and we believe phenablin may have a potential synergistic anti-cancer effect when combined with checkpoint inhibitors and radiotherapy. Based on phenablin's unique mechanism of action and early clinical data, we believe that adding phenablin to checkpoint inhibitor therapy with or without chemotherapy has the potential to improve anti-cancer efficacy while reducing toxicity with IO and or chemotherapy. We believe that these early trials are providing collective evidence of phenablin's role in addressing the unmet medical need in immuno-oncology therapy. On the organizational side, we are rapidly building our medical affairs capabilities in support of the upcoming commercial launch efforts. With that, I will now turn the call over to Rich, who will discuss our commercial preparation. Rich? Thank you, Ramon. Our pre-launch activities and preparations for a commercial launch in the CIN market are building with our PDUFA date set for November 30th. Over the next several months, our seasoned commercial leadership team is preparing to deliver a fully integrated market preparation and launch program to support a successful launch of Penabla in early 2022, complete with elements such as driving awareness of the unmet medical need, or what we call the neutropenia vulnerability gap, continuing our large account outreach, preparing for NCCN guideline submission, KOL development, speaker mobilization, key stakeholder outreach, including patient groups and federal, state, and local legislative initiatives, educational symposium, targeted advisory boards, and finalizing our patient support services to ensure broad access at launch. Specifically, we plan for a dedicated and focused team for the U.S. market. Importantly, we will have a field reimbursement liaison team supported by a patient services hub in place to ensure effective reimbursement from day one to provide support for both providers and patients. We believe this extensive commercial strategy will position us well to successfully launch penavalent combination therapy to capture long-term commercial success. We look forward to updating you on our progress with our pre-launch activities in the coming months. And now I'll turn over to Elizabeth to take you through the financial results. Elizabeth. Thanks, Rich. I will now briefly discuss our second quarter 2021 financial results. For greater detail related to these results, I refer you to our press release issued this morning and to our 6K filing, both of which can be accessed under the investors section of our website. With that, I will now highlight some of the key financial results. R&D expenses, in the second quarter of 2021 were $11.3 million compared to $11.0 million in the same quarter last year. The increase of $0.3 million was primarily due to an increase in personnel cost and non-cash stock-based compensation expense, partially offset by lower clinical trial expense. G&A expenses were $9.0 million in the second quarter of 2021, compared to $2.6 million for the same quarter of 2020. The $6.4 million increase was primarily due to higher personnel cost, non-cash stock-based compensation expense, and higher costs associated with pre-commercialization activities for Planabulin. Net loss in the second quarter of 2021 was $19.3 million 
compared to 12.8 million for the same period last year. Our cash balance at the end of second quarter was $51.3 million, and we had short-term investments of $25.0 million, which we believe will be sufficient to support our ongoing clinical programs over the next year, including our immune oncology pipeline, and to prepare for the potential launch of Planabulin in CIN in early 2022. In addition to reported available cash, we will also receive from Henri approximately $45 million for a $30 million upfront payment plus an equity investment into the China subsidiary related to the Planabulin partnership in China, which Lund described. I do also want to mention that in the U.S., Rich has updated on our efforts to prepare for our own launch of Planabulin in CIN, and we are also evaluating potential partnership opportunities in the U.S., Europe, and other parts of Asia outside of greater China. We are only considering the very top companies who could bring great synergies and help us optimize the value of Planabulin globally. With that, I will now turn the call back over to Lon for closing remarks. Lon? Thank you, Elizabeth. We're very proud of our accomplishments thus far. We have had extremely busy and productive period recently, but we're just starting. Everyone feels the momentum building and our excitement grows as our vision of commercialization penabolin and expanding on our indications comes closer with the potential to help many patients in need. We invite everyone to watch for us at ASMO on September 20th, where we will make a late-breaking presentation on Dublin 3 Phase 3 data in non-small cell lung cancer and our partners for their continued support as we work towards improving the current standard care for cancer patients worldwide. This concludes our prepared remarks today. I will now ask the operator to begin our Q&A session. Operator? Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question today, please press star one from your telephone keypad and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants that are using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. And once again, that is star 1 to ask a question. Thank you. Our first question is coming from the line of Josh Schwimmer with Mevacor ISI. Please proceed with your question. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. First, um, what type of information should we be looking uh, for from the Dublin 3 trial at ESMO? And specifically, are we going to be getting the, the subset analysis, which, uh, which investors have been very focused on? And then second, Investors are clearly concerned that the Dublin 3 trial may not suffice for FDA approval, given that the trial was run mostly uh, outside the U.S. And, and in PD-1 naive patients. As you're discussing the program with partners, do you expect that you're going to need to wait for full approval by the FDA to capture the full value of the program in some kind of a partnership deal? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for your continued support, and thanks for this uh, great question. So let me just touch on both of questions. Number one is for the ASMO uh, presentation, uh, we are going to show the whole data, the ITT population with all the specific numbers with it. And in addition, we're also going to show the subset analysis. Everyone is so eagerly waiting to see, including the PD-1, pd exposed patients, and also the Western patient uh, subset. So, so that's number one question. Number two is uh, regarding your question on the uh, relevance of uh, the study with limited patients from U.S., how it relates to the U.S. population, right? So we, we think that, you know, currently our 
patient population does capture the um, you know the, the current landscape of uh, treatment to the big extent because we do have um, uh, patients uh, who has exposed to PD-1, pd one and from the previous um, experiencing FDA approvals for oncology drugs, uh, there were uh, incidents of um, you know approval using limited patient data from the U.S. Uh, according to the Acuvia report, 27% of the uh, U.S. FDA oncology drug approval actually used less than 10% data from the U.S. So, of course, this is a review issue. So, we will be eagerly discussing this with FDA in our planned uh, pre-NDA meeting. Uh, you know, we're planning for quarter four of this year. Uh, regarding the partnership discussion, I think... You know, this, of course, is a very important topic to discuss, um, but you know, we cannot give any details at, at this moment. Okay, super. Thanks very much. Looking forward to the ESMO presentation. Yeah, thank you. The next question is from the line of Jason Gerbery with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, thanks for taking my questions. Um, two for me on, on Dublin, uh, probably not a big surprise, but just can you, Juan, maybe walk us through the history uh, of the trial, the interim analyses, and, and whether Median OS or Kaplan Meyer OS w w were the pre specified primary endpoint, uh, and whether there were any protocol changes that occurred during the trial. And then my second question is just there, there isn't much debate that Kaplan Meyer OS is a gold standard for measuring OS, but I think investors believe that you know, supportive median OS is needed to ensure that the clinical benefit is meaningful. So just love to get your thoughts on the regulatory implications of supportive median OS, particularly if it falls in, in a more gray area or even a, a negative p-value. Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you so much, um, Jason, for your great question regarding the more details in the history uh, of uh, Dublin 3 and also the primary endpoint questions. So first is, you know, WC has been ongoing for almost six years. So it has been a long trial because it is, uh, you know, 551 patient enrollment globally in U.S., China, and Australia. So along the way, the treatment landscape has also changed, right? And, uh, you know, there are PD-1, pd one treatment approved uh, during the study. So we did, you know, during the study, we did update the protocol to include um, the, the allow lawns to uh, have you know PD1 PD1 failed patients in the study and stratify them. So that's why we are confident with the uh, balancing of two arms with a PD1 you know PD1 PDL1 exposed you know patients. Uh, and then secondly, uh, regarding the primary endpoint, so the primary endpoint has always been overall survivor. Uh, it has never been changed. It's just the uh, analysis of the data, you know, method, right? So one is using the log rank p value, looking at uh, um, you know, the whole uh, Kaplan Meier OS curve, but including in there, there will be, you know, medium uh, OS shown. And in addition, we're also putting the um, restricted mean survival time, which is looking at the mean OS, because penicillin is an immune agent. The mean potentially captures more of the uh, OS benefit for penabolin arm, but both are going to be, you know, shown in the ESMO and also with the NDA filing. So everything is transparent and everybody can see, uh, you know, what is the, you know, profile for penabolin. So in the end, it's the drug is the profile from the KM OS graph, and that's the key. So along the way, we did have the two interim analysis. Uh, right, so and so there is a little historic in the um, p value hit, the statistical hit for the final um, p value, which we need to meet for the log rank p value, which is 0.046. And what we have said in top line is uh, log rank p value for the Dublin 3 in the uh, neoprenabolin plus oxytexel versus oxytexel arm is less than 0.04. So that it does meet this uh, statistical significance in extending overall survivor in the um, in the primary endpoint. So, of course, everybody will see more details in the in the ASMO. Thank you.
Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Maury Raycroft with Jeffries. Please proceed with your questions. Hi, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, to tie the subset analysis to, together for uh, PK bridging data between Western and China patients, is it possible you could disclose uh, some of the PK bridging data at ESMO or at some other point prior to filing the NDA? Yeah, thanks for this great question because this is very important for us to be able to combine the uh, Western and Asian patient data for the NDA submission, not only for the U.S., but also for China FDA. So we had done extensive population PK, and everybody in our CIN studies and also in lung cancer study, everybody has a population PK. So we have rich data for almost, you know, uh, over uh, like 700 patients on the on those data. So currently we have, you know, submitted those data to the regulatory agency, and this is not the PK comparison data usually is not in the, you know, uh, presentation uh, or, you know, for the registration study or in the um, publications. Of course, you know, if everyone is very interested probably in the future, we should, you know, have some kind of a public, um, you know, uh, review on this later, but this is not, it's not going to be uh, discussed in the ASMO, but it is consistent, we're, you know, we're very confident with. Got it. So you're, you're confident in the consistency that you're seeing between the patient populations? Yes, yes. Yeah, they are comparable, they're similar in the population PK in Asian versus Western patients. Got it. Who have it. shown that in many studies. And all the PK data came from Covans, right? We, we use Covans as our central lab. Okay. And then one other question just for the CIN NDA that's under priority review. Can you talk more about the regulatory interactions and feedback um, and whether you've got a mid-cycle review communications and any label discussions yet? Uh, yeah, thanks for this great question. Everyone is eagerly waiting for the final uh, final date, which is November 30th. Yes, so uh, HFDA has been, um, you know, communicating with us uh, very, very infrequent matter and uh, very supportive of our uh, submission because we did have AOM meeting before the document has been successfully received by FDA. We also had um, mid-cycle review, um, and uh, we haven't got to the label discussion yet because it is usually is one to two months before the FDUVA date, then there will be label uh, discussion. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Thank you. Next question is coming from the line of Andy Say with William Blair. Please proceed with your questions. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. And uh, again, congratulations to the team on, a, uh, as you said, transfer, transformative uh, first half and uh, a great start to uh, 2021. Um, so, so I have two questions really um, kind of related to Jason's questions before. Uh, one is is really, um, Lon, maybe you can comment on just how Dublin is conducted from a quality control standpoint, um, data integrity standpoint. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, questions regarding that. Um, and also, since, uh, Lon, you talked a little bit about the p-values, um, I wanted to uh, kind of get your clarification in terms of the p-values uh, uh, listed in the presentation, um, you know, back several weeks ago, following the Dublin 3 top-line results. Uh, I noticed that there were a lot of the p-values that basically provided a range and not a not not basically like a like a like a single number. I, I just want to clarify that that is due to the fact that uh, analysis was still ongoing, and, and that was kind of like the top line results. And we'll basically get um, detailed um, exact p values at the ESMO conference. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Andy, for your great questions and also always your great support. So let me answer your three questions uh, in sequence. So number one is um, we are very confident with our quality of the data because we are using the uh, quality CROs um, to conduct the study, 
as what Ramon just related to you. So our global CIO uh, is uh, ICON, uh, which uh, you know in charge of uh, site selection and patient enrollment and also the monitoring. And, and secondly, we are also using Covans Central Lab to look at all of our blood samples uh, to evaluate the uh, the PK and also the, um, you know uh, blood uh, chemistry, including the ANC numbers. Because you know the ANC actually is important for our secondary endpoint, looking into the grade four neutropenia reduction in penabolin arm versus the docetaxel arm. And thirdly, uh, we also use uh, ICOM PV to um, actually do the SAE reporting and also uh, also collect all the AE data for all the studies, including W3 and also CIN studies and all the ITT uh, studies. And the last but not least, uh, I also want to mention, we also use DRT, which is a, a central uh, lab company, and they actually send all the uh, you know, ECG machine to all the sites to look at, to, to take triplets for the ECG, to look at the cardio safety uh, you know, for, the, for the drug. So all of this is well um, you know, validated uh, CROs, and, and also our conduct is under USGCP. So that answers your first question. And number two is the data integrity. So actually we do use independent statistical company to do the analysis of the data. And so, and also it is, you know, it's also single blinded study to the patients, uh, right? So the patient, uh, when you look at the quality of life data, you know, it will be very trustworthy because patients do not know uh, which arm they are on. So that's the second question. The third question is, you know, great question, a clarification for the p-value in all the, you know, some of the, the primary and also the secondary endpoint, which we actually had released in the top line, because this is a top line, right? So, and, and really we cannot disclose much because we are saving it for a big major medical conference, which is coming up in ESMO. So that's why it was just only showing a range. Okay, great. Thanks for 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 all the uh, detailed explanations, Vaughn. Uh, maybe just one more. Um, you know, kind of heading into the ESMO conference, I wanted to get your perspective on how you would view the PFS data. Obviously, you know, whenever you look at OS, it's always kind of confounded by subsequent therapies. So, you know, maybe kind of a you know two parter. One is uh, uh, maybe can you comment on uh, based on the geography, what are some of the subsequent therapies that patients could get uh, on Dublin three, and um, also how would you kind of interpret and, and look at the PFS results uh, in the context of the um, the positive OS? Yeah, that that's really a, a brilliant question uh, because um, you know for all the clinical studies, I think the gold standard is OS, right? Because in the end, we want to provide the long some survivor for, for patients, um, and uh, that is, you know, what uh, all the patients and the FDA and also physicians are looking for. So OS is the, the gold standard. But in the end, um, but in addition, we also want to use um, PFS and ORR, you know, also to, to look at the drug effect, right, for, and there's no noise from the later uh, treatment. So, so, so that is what you are getting at. So do we see a drug effect? adding to the benefit of docetaxel in the PFS. And as you see, the p-value is less than 0.01, right, from the directional p-value, which we shared in the top line. So we are seeing, you know, better um, uh, improvement in cannabinoid adding to um, docetaxel, not only in the PFS the benefit, right, and also in the OR, which also showed statistical significance. And your, your, your last question also asked about what's the later uh, treatment after, um, you know, the patients out of the study. You know, as you know, both, it is a randomized study, so, so both arms are balanced. And patients, after they get out, they, of course, they do have a desire to live, so, you know, have a good uh, therapy to be treated. So uh, afterwards, they usually use, you know, TKIs, and also they do have PD-1 or PD-L1 exposures, but limited, and also they're balanced. Got it. 
Got it. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. The next question is coming from the line of Joel Beatty with Baird. Please proceed with your question. Hi, congrats on the progress. For the CIN indication, there's been recent attention among investors that most of the patients in the trials were from outside the U.S. Could you discuss if FDA is okay with the number of U.S. patients in the CIN studies? And, and then also, could you discuss how closely the chemotherapy regimens used in those CIN studies resemble what's currently used in the U.S.? Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thanks for initiating the report <laughs> for us recently. Um, yeah, so this is a great question. So for the CIN indication, as you know, we're going after uh, a broad label for penavalin uh, combined with GCSS uh, in preventing of CIN in all chemotherapy and all solid tumor, right? So, so it is a broad label, and uh, you know, study one or six phase three or protect two is a pivotal study which supports this this label. And in addition, we also have five other clinical studies to support um, you know this this label right, from a safety point of view and also from penavalent pharmacology in its uh, working, you know, uh, in uh, protecting neutrophil in week one uh, after chemotherapy as what Rich. Ninety six to one hundred percent in you know according to literature right so so there's a lot of room to improve uh, there uh, and so but then so so in a way it's, it's not so relevant to show you know is PAC still used in the u s it's more like it's using as a template to evaluate the drug effect for penavalin you know combination with GCSF or any new current uh, you know any new agent in development for the CIN. Prevention. So coming back to the one six phase three, you know, patient population, you know, it is um, mainly you know coming from the from the two countries, right? Around you know fifty percent in China, fifty percent around in Ukraine. So Ukraine patients are representing the Western patient, and if they agree with that, you know, China of course is Asian uh, patients because U.S. is just rarely used TAC um, because TAC with GSS still have such harsh your grade three and four neutropenia as high as 100 percent. So, but so it's not really used as very much. A lot of target therapies are used for breast cancer, and then uh, for the Western, uh, for for the Eastern Europe and China, still TAC is used. That's why you can enroll patient to really uh, evaluate uh, prevalence uh, drug effect. And so far, FDA hasn't had any issues with this uh, breakdown because they have seen our raw data. They also look at our uh, clinical conduct um, and uh, and uh, also you know look at the, um, the the ETMF and everything and then this has not been an issue and they have successively uh, accepted our filing with prior to review and also with no ODAC. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for all those helpful details. Maybe one more question related to. Um, discussions with potential partners from, from the U.S. And, and other countries. How much of the focus on those potential partners is on um, marketing versus um, clinical development of additional indications? Mm. Well, so I think this this probably you know it's still ongoing, 
with the potential partners um, for the U.S. global uh, market, potential partnership. Um, and this is, you know, of course, it's a com combination of all of that, right, because it is very importantly, uh, Panavlin, um is shown as potentially now has this dual benefit in the anti-cancer benefit in extending survival and also in reduction of chemotherapy and neutropenia. So with that profile, it really is a gateway into multiple indications, um, we believe, in the I.O. combination therapy. So, so of course, Patina will be very interested in, the, uh, in those additional uh, development, which will give a lot of potential for cannabinoid, and in the end is to help many patients. Of course, commercialization is near term, right? So that's also in the discussion points. But as you see from our recent partnership deal with uh, Henry, which is a well, very, very respected company in China in the uh, oncology space, and we do think the synergy is also giving us a one plus one greater two. Uh, in their discussion, as you see from the terms, right? So, you know, commercialization, we are very much, um, um, you know, grateful to their uh, support because uh, they have top uh, sellers of PD-1 and also top sellers of uh, Doxitaxel and top three sellers of uh, Pepsodegrastin, but also they have a lot of other, you know, agents in their pipeline, actually, which, which could potentially also in combination with Panabin because Panabin is a very interesting and uh, multi-talented child in our way. So, so those are going to have more indications and more differentiated therapy regime potentially, you know, for for patients in need. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, you may press star one. The next question is from the line of Joe Pantkinis with AC Wainwright. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for all the details, and uh, I think you've done a good job, uh, really, in uh, addressing a lot of potential concerns uh, that are out there, so thanks for that. Um, so I actually have a couple logistical questions. Uh, first, uh, with regard to Henri, um, just wanted to see, you know, what are some of the rate-limiting steps right now? I mean, you have uh, some tech transfer to do. You know, what other things are outstanding to make sure that they could efficiently uh, launch planabulin um, Officially, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and that's what we're currently actively doing with Henry. Our China team is uh, working with them, starting from the second day uh, from the signing. <laughs> so from August the 26th, we have been working daily with um, the our partner at, at Henry, and they're very eager to get all of their medical. Um, science liaison team on board, you know, in understanding and also making the, uh, you know, the messaging right. is um, just regarding, like, the milestone payments, how are you looking to account for these, you know, and amortize or, you know, uh, recognize uh, all up front or what have you? Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Joe. And we are very actively um, discussing that with EY, who's our global auditor. And, um, you know, we, we for sure will be booking all of the uh, monies that come in. Uh, we've not uh, given up booking of revenue, and uh, yes, we'll have to go through the dance with them on deciding um, how to book the revenue. Understood, and uh, thanks for all the and, details. And I'm just, looking forward to ESMO. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, and as far as the milestones go, of course, you know, those will um, receive, I'm sure, very normal uh, accounting treatments, and um, hopefully some will be um, um, problems of booking that we'll have to deal with sooner rather than later. We expect that. Sure. Thanks again. Thank you. There are no further questions. 
And I will now turn the call over to Dr. Wong for her closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for the call today. Your time is precious. And uh, thank you for being on this uh, meaningful journey with us to support us. And uh, together, you are our partners to help many patients in need. Thank you, and have a nice day, and have a nice weekend. This concludes today's conference. May disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.